Um, with a lot of gratitude, I would like to acknowledge that uh, we're on the land um, hosting this session on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples. That includes the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations, and the Métis Charter community of the Lower Mainland. And wherever you are in the, this province or the country, depending on where you're calling in from, um, you too are on lands that we are grateful have been tended for and cared for by uh, peoples before us. Uh, and we are committed and continue to learn about uh, ways of our Indigenous uh, um, peoples in the country. Uh, I was privileged to be part of a um, meeting yesterday where Indigenous ways of knowing and being, especially in the context of uh, palliative care and uh, honoring and respecting people as they pass, um, were taught and passed down and uh, really um, grateful for the things that we continue to learn. Um, so I think all of us should reflect on ways that we can continue to learn and then incorporate those into our current, um, our own teachings as well as our own ways of doing. Next slide. So province-wide rounds, as you know, is a collaboration between the UBC Division of Nephrology and BC Renal. Uh, without the generous support of our industry partners, as well as uh, all of your support in the different health authorities, uh, it wouldn't be possible to make sure that all of us are as up-to-date uh, as we could possibly be with respect to what's uh, new in nephrology, all in the interest of uh, best care for our patients. So thank you all for the contributions. Next slide. So it's really a great pleasure and privilege to be able to introduce Dr. Wayne Hung, who is a um, clinical assi assistant professor at um, University of British Columbia and a practicing nephrologist at the Royal Columbian Hospital. He completed his core nephrology fellowship at UBC and collaborated with the UBC Division of Geriatric Medicine to create a pilot geriatric nephrology curriculum uh, of which he was the inaugural trainee. So that's a, quite a feat, Wayne, and hopefully one to be repeated and continued. Um, he provides geriatric care for kidney patients at St. Paul's Hospital Elder Care Clinic, as well as at the Royal Columbian Hospital Geriatric Nephrology Clinic. Um, and uh, welcome, Wayne, to help update us on geriatric nephrology past, present, and future. Thank you, Adira, for the really kind introduction. Um, to get started here. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for the invitation to speak today um, on this topic of geriatric nephrology in BC, which is um, clearly a, a topic near and dear uh, to my heart. I don't have any disclosures. So over the next 45 to min 50 minutes or so, um, I'd like to cover these objectives. So number one, to um, highlight why I think it is important to look at incorporating geriatric medicine expertise in CKD care. Uh, number two, to share with you where things are at in terms of geriatric nephrology, both in Canada and uh, locally in BC. And then number three, um, to discuss where uh, some of our current projects are and where some of my future ideas lie. And this is where I uh, am very happy to take any uh, suggestions. So I want to start off with a case just to sort of build our um, talk around. So this is Mr. G. So he's a 75-year-old gentleman who is on hemodialysis, and I, I saw in comprehensive geriatric assessment. He, unfortunately, had been declining from a memory standpoint. This is noticed by his family, by his uh, nephrologists. He had fallen many times over the past year, and uh, family was now having some difficulty managing, um, coping uh, with him at home. So I th think this description has probably um, painted a picture uh, that is not unfamiliar, unfamiliar to all of you. Um, and later on in the talk, I will uh, take you through how uh, we uh, went through this case. So, you know, I, I talk about aging and geriatrics isn't complete without a look at where our population is going in Canada. So this is Stats Canada. Uh, this is a population pyramid. And I'm just going to play this for you. This is starting from the year 1960. And I want you to look at 
how our demographic has changed over the past 60 years. It's pausing here at 2021, which is the date of the data collection and the projecting uh, 15 years into the future. So, you know, you can see that there is this wave or some people call it the silver tsunami of older people. Um, and that has really increased over the past number of decades and will only continue to increase. Uh, this is also uh, an infographic from Stats Canada, but you know all that is to say that we have experienced a tremendous growth in our seniors population, and that is projected to climb. So going from 6 million to over 10 million in the next 15 years or so. And then across the country, understanding that our age group of Page, uh, people who are 75 years old or older is going to double across the country. And certainly that is projected to happen in BC as well. So not surprisingly, you know, we see that reflected in our CKD patients. Um, this is core data, uh, a little bit older, but I wanted to capture the earlier um, years in the, in the late 90s, where you see this quite dramatic rise in the number of older adults with end-stage kidney disease. So that is the solid uh, line there, um, which represents uh, patients over the age of 75, and has really become the predominant um, population uh, of our CKD or ESRD patients. This is the uh, same data, but represented in a table format. But what I wanted to highlight were the differences between the box on the left and the box on the right. So on the left, we have the pediatric population. On the right, we have those um, age over 75. We have the absolute numbers in terms of number of patients across Canada with ESRD as well as the rate per million population. And essentially, when you look at the pediatric population, that number has been static over the past 20 years. There's about 400 patients or so every year. Um, whereas in the age 75 plus group, um, in 2001, you had about 3,100 patients um, with ESRD across the country. And then as of 2020, that number is now 8,300. So, you know, quite a dramatic increase that seems to grow year by year. So as people get older and more people get kidney disease, dialysis is the fountain of youth, right? Clearly, it isn't. Um, this is core um, data again, um, uh, showing uh, survival rates of dialysis patients at three months, one year, three years, five years, and 10 years, and broken down by age group. And once again, I want to draw your attention to my box there, which looks at the 75 plus age group. And you can see that the five year survival rate is not great, you know, got about a quarter of patients left at five years time, which really is comparable to many cancer diagnoses. And we know that as patients become more comorbid or more frail, that the survival benefit then shrinks. And studies have demonstrated that in patients with high degree of comorbidity, you know, we're really talking about a survival benefit in the order of probably months, which is then similar to metastatic cancer. And as we know, and as we see, a lot of that bonus time, so to speak, is spent in hospital or spent on dialysis. So why do dialysis at all for the elderly? Um, I thought it was interesting to look at the patient perspective. Now, this is uh, older now, this is from 1999, but this is uh, a survey um, uh, of uh, both community dwelling and nursing home dwelling um, patients in the U.S. and um, surveying their perceptions about dialysis and its benefits. And very interestingly, the, va the vast majority of these patients would choose to have dialysis, uh, including the vast majority of nursing home patients. They want to do dialysis at home as well, which we know is not often the case. Uh, what I found um, 
uh, to be um, uh, highlight in this survey was the fact that many of them thought that dialysis would help them stay independent, help them stay free from major symptoms, and that it was helpful for um, facilitating good quality of life. And quality of life on dialysis might have been tolerable in the past. So early studies, small studies in the 80s, seem to suggest that elderly patients had an acceptable degree of quality of life. And the purported reason was that it enabled them to socialize, it regularized um, these social outings. But of course, you know, elderly patients who were dialyzing in the 1980s are probably not the same patients we now see on dialysis. In fact, we know that recent studies uh, capture this significant decline in quality of life in uh, the increase in the burden of disease, burden of symptoms, burden of impairments. So now when you look out over your dialysis unit or your um, kidney care clinic and, and your elderly patients with CKD, I think this is now what we see. You, know, you see a fair amount of dismobility of uh, gait aids, of uh, wheelchair use. Um, there are high rates of depression, um, bothersome symptoms. Uh, I put a skeleton here to represent, you know, the risk of fractures with deranged bone metabolism, but also to highlight the weight loss and anorexia that can happen. You have medications on medications and complications on medications. Uh, you have nutritional uh, issues, um, poor appetite, dietary restrictions, um, limited intake, erosion of cognition, augmentation, and of course, falls. So what I'm really um, alluding to here are the geriatric giants. I wanted to touch on two of these geriatric giants specifically. So um, first being cognition. So this is um, a series of self-portraits that I think many of you will have seen in the past done by an American German artist who um, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's uh, in uh, 1995, and that was the time he made that top middle painting. And then in the uh, years since, over the next five years, you can see how his um, artwork then unfortunately changed. So we know that cognitive impairment is prevalent in patients with chronic kidney disease. And when people have looked at this relationship, they found that there was you know, a graded association between the degree of kidney impairment and the degree of cognitive impairment. The prevalence you know, would seem to vary depending on the study and the, um, the population studied, but some have estimated as high as 70% 70, 70 of hemodialysis patients have underdiagnosed or unrecognized cognitive impairment. Um, some estimates are more in the realm of 40%, but even then including upwards of a quarter with mild dementia, and then some uh, more with moderate or severe dementia. As patients progress onto dialysis, um, Studies have also demonstrated that cognition seems to decline more rapidly compared to CKD patients who are not on dial dialysis and similar patients in the general population who do not have chronic kidney disease. This is on the basis of uh, MOCA scores. Now, when they looked at these MOCA scores and the domains where there were deficits, they noticed that they seemed to be more prominent in the area of, of executive function which would seem to um, agree with our current thinking for how uh, cognition can become further impaired on dialysis with uh, vascular insults, cerebral hypoperfusion, and a stunning that can occur. People have also looked at whether or not there was a relationship between cognitive impairment and dialysis adequacy, and really we do not see any clear relationship there. Uh, the next um, geriatric giant I wanted to talk about is frailty, which is what I was trying to convey with this uh, cartoon that I found. 
So frailty is, you know, a, a layperson term, but it is a real medical disease. And I think the best way to describe frailty is to think of it as someone who has a reduced reserve to physiologic stress. So in somebody who's severely frail, when an external stressor happens, like an illness or injury, um, they have a decline in their function and they do not bounce back to the same level. Um, and with every insult, there are higher levels of dependency. There are a lot of ways that people have, um, uh, a lot of tools that people have used to try and uh, qualify or quantify the degree of frailty including the Freed Index that some of you may have seen, the Freed Frailty Scale, uh, and then more recently, the Clinical Frailty Scale, uh, which is a Canadian um, product that uh, was developed in Dalhousie by Dr. Rockwood. And I do think this is the um, most applicable tool that you can use clinically at the bedside, where just knowing um, what patients are able to do uh, with respect to the ADLs, you can categorize their level of frailty from a scale uh, from one, very fit, to nine, terminally ill. We know that frailty in the general population, independent of anything else, kidney disease, cardiac disease, dementia, just frailty um, predicts mortality. And when you apply that to patients with ESRD, not surprisingly, we see uh, those um, uh, that phenomenon as well. So uh, this was a study taking um, incident dialysis patients and assigning them a clinical frailty score at the time of dialysis initiation. And then over the course of follow-up, which is around one and a half years, um, you can see that patients who are more frail at the time of dialysis initiation um, tended to not have survived by the time of follow-up and tended not to have had successful transplants. Um, so higher clinical frailty scores and initiation seems to purport higher mortality in new dialysis patients. Function is important as well. And we know that unfortunately, dialysis is associated with a decline in function, even when you take quote unquote good or independent older adults um, who are starting dialysis. So. Uh, this is published by Dr. Jassel, um, and she looked at um, elderly patients who, as you can see there in that dark blue bar, were mostly independent at the time of dialysis initiation. And you can see subsequently every six months, that dark blue bar shrinks um, almost by half at six months time. And, and there are just higher rates of either requiring assistance or full support. Finally, we know that end-of-life care in end-stage kidney disease tends to be one filled with acuity. Um, so this was uh, an American study that took uh, Medicare patients um, who were on a dialysis and looked at the final month of their life. And they compared it to similar patients who had cancer diagnosis and similar patients who had heart failure diagnoses and found that dialysis patients were had higher rates of hospitalization, of uh, being in the ICU, of having undergone intensive procedures in the final month of their life, and had much lower rates of uh, being in hospice and were way more likely to have died in hospital. So hopefully what I've illustrated to you is that when it comes to the elderly population with kidney disease, it becomes a bit of a web of uh, interactions between frailty, impairments, geriatric giants, kidney disease, and all affecting things that are important to patients like quality of life and survival. So this is my attempt at trying to sort of simplify that, that relationship a little bit. So on the left, um, you can see how um, geriatric syndromes can impact kidney disease and kidney care. So for example, patient with dementia may not be able to um, manage their CKD as well. It certainly would affect decisions around their dialysis or ESRD uh, modality. 
uh, certainly would affect transplant candidacy. It would affect their ability to engage in care in general, to adhere to treatments and recommendations, and certainly would affect uh, the burden of symptoms and our management thereof. On the right, as I've shown you, kidney disease itself can have an, a major impact on geriatric syndromes as well when it comes to cognition, independence, physical fitness, mobility, as well as polypharmacy. And both of them sort of compound together to shape patients' quality of life, frailty, and how we go about advanced care planning. So this is where I think geriatric medicine comes in. And, and to me, um, after spending uh, a lot of time with geriatricians, I found that their expertise is really in complexity. So uh, the current framework for geriatric medicine is something called the 5M model of care. Um, so starting with you know, the thumb there, it is important to understand what matters most to patients when it comes to healthcare decisions. It is important to improve care for the mind or fermentation and address things like dementia, delirium, depression. It is important to promote mobility and to prevent falls and fractures. It is important to look at medications, to review, to reduce, to remove medications that may be potentially harmful or unnecessary. And then finally, to consider multi-complexity. So frailty, um, complex psychosocial situations, um, caregiver education, support planning. In order to do that, um, geriatricians um, do something called a comprehensive geriatric assessment. And what it is essentially is a head-to-toe uh, medical assessment that goes system by system, taking into account um, patient's personal history, their social circumstances, uh, their medications, uh, their values and wishes, and trying to integrate something that is pro uh, proactive, that is prognostic, that is supportive, and takes the long-term picture in mind. I think of it almost as like the superpower of the geriatrician. And there are really a lot of well-studied benefits as it relates to quality of life, improving cognition, maintaining function, and delaying time to institutionalization. So you say, right, that's just knockout comprehensive geriatric assessments for renal patients. That's easy, right? Unfortunately, there have been traditional challenges with this. Number one, it is a very time-consuming assessment. Um, it does require a specific setting as well. It's not well adapted to be done in the dialysis unit or our usual kidney care settings. Number two, as I've mentioned, the issues can often be very intertwined and you're often not just looking at a geriatric problem or a kidney problem, you're probably looking at a bit of both. And so it can be very difficult for individual nephrologists to be managing all of these issues, but it can also be difficult for a geriatrician to understand the nuances of CKD care, of dialysis, of transplantation. And then finally, you know, we are blessed in the lower mainland here to have access to geriatricians, but that's not always the case. You know, my understanding is once you get, you know, past the Fraser Valley, you know, um, to the east and past the North Shore to the north and Victoria on, on the west, there really aren't a lot of geriatricians out there. So it may not even be an option, depending on where you are. Well, what if we look at incorporating geriatric assessments into the nephrology clinic? Uh, this um, uh, was um, published in uh, the Journal of American Geriatric Society in 2016, and it was really interesting, but two different groups in the VA in the US uh, wanted to come up with a model where you incorporated some form of geriatric assessment. Um, and they were doing this in, in parallel uh, and then decided to publish their, their experience. So um, on the left there was a project that was called the CGA for CKD. 
And this was a um, collaboration between a geriatric medicine and a nephrology with the idea of embedding a geriatrician into the kidney clinic. Um, and then, you know, sort of co-managing with the nephrologist thereafter to try and come up with um, individualized treatment plans. So in this project, they basically took all comers who were 70 years old plus in their kidney clinic and, and put them through uh, the geriatric assessment. On the right is a project uh, that they called the Renal Silver Program, where it was a nephrologist that had a palliative care background and then did extra training in geriatric medicine, who uh, was then the person to conduct geriatric assessments in the kidney clinic. And in this project, um, they took patients who were 75 and older who had more advanced CKD. In both projects, and again, the patients that they looked after were different, but they identified that there were really quite high rates of functional limitations, functional dependence, history of falls, impaired mobility, and cognitive impairment. Many of these things, which probably would have gone unrecognized, but now that it had been reviewed and discussed, were then used to inform kidney decisions going forward, but also broad medical decisions. The authors wanted to highlight three specific themes that was notable throughout uh, these two projects. One, that the geriatric assessments really helpful for the providers to anticipate risks and to prior prioritize concerns depending on uh, the individual. So for example, if cognitive impairment was um, diagnosed or revealed through the visit, then it was a consideration uh, when it came towards um, how kidney disease should be managed, how the medications, the regimen should be designed. Number two, the assessments were helpful for the patients and their families and caregivers to recognize, understand, and discuss nuanced treatment decisions. So for example, participants were more likely and uh, interested in conservative care after understanding how the impact of dialysis uh, would um, change their functional capacity or cognitive capacity. And then finally, the assessments were also helpful in identifying those older adults who were actually quite resilient and who should um, uh, benefit from more traditional CKD management and potentially um, more stringent risk factor modification uh, and who may benefit from treatments that would require a longer time horizon to benefit. So whether it's medical treatment or dialysis or transplant. So where are we at in the field of geriatric nephrology? Well, in the States, it seems to be a little bit more widespread. In fact, if you go on the ASN website, they have a whole online curriculum that you can do yourself um, on this topic of geriatric nephrology. And it's got like 25 chapters and very uh, in-depth and well-written stuff. If you looked at fellowship programs, there are a whole number of geriatric and or palliative nephrology fellowships that are offered. But what about in Canada? So if you did a search for a long time, the only thing you would come across is Dr. Vanita Jassel. Uh, and many of you will remember that um, she had uh, presented for us at Province Wide Rounds a couple of years ago in person, so pre-COVID. Um, and I was fortunate to spend a bit of time with Dr. Jassel in Toronto as well, just to understand um, her approach to uh, a geriatric nephrology. So she um, has an inpatient geriatric nephrology team that runs um, parallel to the inpatient team and sort of assists with um, trickier discussions uh, as well as care of more frail and elderly patients. She oversees a hemodialysis unit, which is on site at a rehab center and is able to do, you know, maybe less conventional um, hemodialysis, so more short daily or nocturnal hemodialysis with the express goal of facilitating rehabilitation. 
on an outpatient basis, Dr. Jasso had you know, her, her, her kidney care clinic and would sort of um, see patients a little bit more informally, so having referrals from other nephrologists to look at geriatric syndromes. As I say, for a long time, this, this was the only place where you could get um, some education, training, or fellowship. This is until recently, where um, now McMaster now has a program. So Dr. Mona Sidhu is a geriatrician who did the fellowship with Dr. Jassel in Toronto and then decided to um, uh, expand on that uh, back in Hamilton. And with that, they had Dr. Mira Joseph, who is a nephrologist, who then went through their fellowship program. And during this process, they established a pilot clinic, um, which expanded and formalized a referral process for um, uh, nephrologists to send their patients from kidney care, from hemodialysis, from peritoneal dialysis, and now transplant as well. Uh, they had the support of a dedicated geriatric trained nurse who could then administer standardized cognitive tests and these assessments were being done jointly by both Mona and Mira um, and, and had um, a collaborative approach. So I was lucky enough to spend some time with Mona and Mira, and uh, I am happy to see that their clinic has been formalized as of the past year. And on top of that, they were able to create a conservative care clinic uh, where they um, tend to symptom management, they do home visits um, and act as sort of a, a safety net for patients uh, on that pathway. They have now expanded their fellowship program. And uh, my understanding is that currently there is a trainee from McGill um, who uh, hopes to bring something back to Montreal as well. Uh, they've been able to incorporate their um, clinic into the core uh, curriculum for uh, their nephrology and geriatric trainees. And, and has been a popular elective for palliative care trainees as well. So when I came back from my visits in Ontario, you know, we really wanted to think about what can we do here in BC? And specifically, this was at St. Paul's Hospital. So this was the start of um, my uh, training in geriatric medicine. And we thought it would be a good idea to try and come up with a similar pilot clinic um, which would then act as longitudinal clinic experience. And um, I am uh, very grateful to the divisions of uh, geriatric medicine at Province and UBC for supporting this. So we were able to get uh, space um, in the elder care clinic, clinical uh, clerical support. And, um, you know, we uh, took inspiration from uh, Hamilton's program and decided to open up a service to uh, hemo, PD, KCC, and transplant with the goal of providing dedicated comprehensive geriatric assessments. So our pilot clinic ran for about you know, 10 months and through it all, we had um, close to 40 visits um, with uh, a nearly 30 unique patients seen in consultation. The bulk of our referrals, not surprisingly, came from hemodialysis, um, but also came from transplant as well, which I will show you in a second. But I wanted to share with you what happened on these visits and why these patients were there. So cognition was the by far the most common reason for referral, but there were for things like frailty, falls, behavioral issues on dialysis, uh, home hemodialysis assessment, things like that as well. Through the comprehensive geriatric assessments that we administered uh, on these visits, we were able to make formal diagnoses around dementia, frailty, as well as things like primary psychiatric disorders, um, identify risk factors for falls, and in some patients find that they in fact did not have any evidence of dementia. As a result of these findings, we were able to take a number of actions, which often involve looping back, with the primary renal team or nephrologist, um, utilizing the renal allied health team, making referrals to the social worker, working with the renal pharmacist, working with the community services, and as well, taking the new information we had, revising uh, goals of care in many of these cases. 
For transplant, the flavor was a little bit different. Of course, we were still looking at cognition and frailty and function and falls. But now on top of that, you know, we wanted to comment a little bit on the risks from a perioperative or peritransplant standpoint, which can be hard to do because really there is no literature out there or guidance out there to tell us how to go about doing that. So we, you know, borrowed heavily from the geriatric perioperative literature to try and estimate risks of perioperative delirium, uh, functional decline, a risk to inst institutionalization. Um, but I think this is an area where uh, we, we could probably, um, 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 you know, expand to see what more we can standardize. As of now, I just looked back to see of the eight pre-transplant patients we had seen, um, five of them had been approved, one is still on the wait list, and four have been successfully transplanted. Um, and to give you an idea um, of who these patients are, we had a 78-year-old who had spent three years on hemodialysis, who did have mild cognitive impairment, who uh, was pre-frail, um, but ultimately, you know, was approved for transplantation. And at this point, he is post-transplant. He has a creatinine of 85. He did have NSTEMI post-op, so it did prolong his hospitalization, but he did not have delirium. Uh, he went home, and the last clinic visit um, mentions that he's now going on a two-week cruise. So, you know, this is stuff that, you know, I think really makes this worthwhile. I want to bring things back to our case. So this is Mr. G. Um, he was seen in the elder care clinic. And if you remember, he's a 75-year-old gentleman with memory decline, frequent falls, um, difficulty with um, family at home. So these are portions of the CJ we had done, but essentially we found that this is a gentleman who has been on dialysis for a year already. Uh, and actually had expressed uh, wishes for peritoneal dialysis, but already at that time, there were concerns from family with respect to his cognition. He was quite dependent. Um, he used a four-wheel walker. His life space was really just confined to the home, and he required his family members to help him navigate the health system and disease management. Speaking with the patient himself, he tells us things that family has never heard about before. He says, I think things have gotten much worse after I started dialysis. My memory is poor. I feel depressed. I can't sleep. I feel weak. And all I can think about is, do I have dialysis today? And when do I have it again? He's fallen four times over the past six months, uh, including uh, one resulting in the code blue. He tells us and he tells his family, I'm hurting a lot. Um, maybe it is better to just let me go. And at this point, he is a full code. And there have not been previous conversations, um, especially with his family, around these types of wishes. So in our assessment, we find that he does meet criteria for a major neurocognitive disorder, um, probably mixed vascular and Alzheimer dementia. He fortunately did not have any uh, behavioral issues or neuropsychiatric issues that would necessitate the use of psychotropics. But at the same time, given this diagnosis, there really wasn't a role for any particular pharmacologic therapy. We had a long discussion about his diagnosis of dementia and that it probably predated dialysis, but has become more prominent and will only continue to become more prominent and progress with time on dialysis. We felt that he had enough symptoms um, to, to indicate the initiation of mirtazapine to address depression and anxiety, as well as help with sleep. We referred him for physiotherapy on an outpatient basis to try and modify what we can in terms of his risk factors for falls, many of which were non-modifiable. We made um, changes to his medications uh, in view of falls risk, so things like gabapentin, um, his A1C at this point was excellent, so we stopped his insulin. And, you know, we took things off like statin, you know, which we did not think would benefit him in the short um, um, 
time period we were working with. And finally, given what he had set to us, we uh, revised his code status. And at this point, given the number of changes we had um, enacted, he uh, wanted to actually give things some time to see if things could get better before contemplating stopping dialysis. So in follow-up, about three months later, things are better. His mood has improved. He is sleeping better on the metazapine. His sister says he is like his old self again. He's motivated. He's doing physiotherapy uh, as an outpatient. Uh, he's doing the um, intradialytic exercise program at St. Paul's. And he's doing some home exercises. And as a result, he has not fallen. A couple months later, we see Mr. G again in re-referral. At this point, the problems are more related to high interdialytic fluid gains, crashing on dialysis, and more conflict with family at home, specifically around dietary limitations and restrictions. He would often forget if he just had uh, a beverage or food and would request more only to be um, met with resistance from his family. So we attended a family meeting held uh, by the dialysis team. Uh, number one, to explore at this point, is it still within his wishes to continue dialysis? And um, his idea was to try and modify things again, as we did last time. So we adjusted his mirtazapine. We um, went over some caregiver strategies with his family, especially around communication uh, with patients with dementia, and referred Mr. G for the adult day program. The next part is a little bit counterintuitive, but we actually agreed and recommended that he should have more dialysis four times a week. You know, keeping in mind that if his goal was to eat and drink and not be uh, nagged, quote unquote, by his family, then the trade off would be to do more dialysis. And in fact, he uh, was agreeable to this. So follow up another six months later, he is described as beaming. He is attending the adult daycare on his non-dialysis days. He's actually made new friends. He is enjoying socializing with them. He's been discharged from outpatient physiotherapy and hasn't fallen since having met him over a year ago. He's sleeping well, his mood is good, and there's harmony at home. From a dialysis standpoint, he's achieving his goal weights on four times a week. And actually, as his dementia has progressed, he's he was no longer able to keep track of the day of the week. So it was actually less distressing for him, not knowing whether or not he had dialysis yesterday or, or if he has dialysis today. Things were stable until a couple months thereafter, and he was found to have a liver mass and highly likely felt to be uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And at this point, given the journey that he had been on and given the number of conversations that, that people have had with him, he decided, you know what, I know what things might be like and I um, don't want to be, um, I don't want to have any more testing. I don't want to suffer. And I think this is time for me to stop dialysis. And so he passed away um, shortly thereafter. But I think Mr. G's case highlights, you know, the kind of work that we were able to do uh, in the elder care clinic at St. Paul's, um, which is, you know, to, to explore um, a whole number of issues that uh, were identified outside of the initial reasons for consultation. And I think that is um, the advantage of doing a comprehensive geriatric assessment. And um, the geriatricians thought it was quite nice to have someone like me around who has a bit more knowledge about the inner workings of dialysis, uh, the resources in dialysis, and the people to talk to and having access to the social worker and the pharmacist and the dietitian, things that they do not have access to. It was um, uh, really great uh, to work with the dialysis team in the co-management of uh, patients like Mr. G and to participate in family meetings or rounds. And from a transplant standpoint, as I alluded to, you know, I think things are still early, but I would be um, I'm very intrigued by how things go for the patients that we've seen in pre-transplant assessment. 
at this point, um, I'm continuing to service at Elder Care Clinic um, and uh, dedicating these assessments for PD, KCC, hemo, transplant patients. And we are starting to include some geriatric trainees as well who go through uh, the Elder Care Clinic. Uh, as many of you know, I subsequently joined uh, the nephrology group in Fraser, and we got to thinking about what we can do um, from a geriatric nephrology standpoint in Fraser Health. So we came up with a pilot clinic um, based at Royal Columbia Hospital that we've just launched uh, last month um, with the help of our uh, multidisciplinary working group. And similar to the one that we had at St. Paul's, they wanted to uh, expand it to patients across the spectrum of kidney disease, and at this time, including CDUs and home hemo patients as well. What we wanted to experiment with, with and do a little bit differently was to actually use a multidisciplinary approach this time around. It, with a comprehensive geriatric assessment, you know, you are often wearing different hats. You know, you are uh, doing the social and functional inquiry, you are doing the medication reconciliation, medication review. Well, these are already things that our renal allied health team members already do really well. So why not take advantage of their expertise and pre-existing relationship with the patient. So we are utilizing an approach where we take uh, the social work and pharmacy teams from the patient's primary renal service and including them as part of the geriatric nephrology uh, assessment. We are also making the referral process easy for any, of the mem any member of the team to put in. As you know, Often it is the nurse or the social worker, the pharmacist or the dietitian who first notices changes or has concerns about a patient and um, for them to be able to uh, request an assessment with our clinic. At this time, um, the uh, physician portion is done by myself, but we will be adding uh, a geriatrician, uh, Dr. Belinda Rodis, uh, in 2024 uh, as well. And, um, I'm fortunate to have Dr. Rodis, who actually had spent time with Dr. Jassel in Toronto as a geriatrician with interest in CKD. Looking forward, depending on how things go with our clinic, our vision is to try and uh, expand uh, things to other Fraser Health sites, such as Surrey uh, or Abbotsford. Um, and the idea, again, is to see if we can utilize pre-existing expertise um, uh, from the local uh, renal, renal allied health team members to try and recreate or democratize portions of the CGA. This may help lower the barrier for a local geriatrician to want to then participate in the clinic. And I think regardless, we'll build capacity in, um, within renal to provide geriatric focused care. They've always had the skill set, but it's the focus that that would be a bit different. Ultimately, there is a few models that I can envision in terms of how we can make it happen. So as I mentioned, we can try and recruit local geriatricians into the clinic with the support of the renal uh, team um, in places where geriatricians um, don't exist. Um, we can then still try and centralize the assessment at a primary center, for example, say RCH, but with uh, local renal allied health support. And then finally, and this would be a little bit more resource intensive, but um, there's a possibility that we can develop um, perhaps a um, more standardized uh, approach that a trained allied health team member uh, can then follow, let's say administering um, screening tools for cognition, for frailty, for mobility, which then can be just done locally by uh, the person with expertise. Another angle um, that I thought about is to merge um, geriatric and palliative nephrology. You know, uh, there is already a pre-existing palliative nephrology clinic um, based out of Royal Columbian and offered to Fraser patients, which is um, run by Dr. Morgan Lamb. And we've talked about it, and it just seems to make sense to, to try and um, consolidate our services under one umbrella. And this may give us potentially more momentum to try and expand a multidisciplinary team or to um, dedicate uh, someone 
um, who would then go on to uh, uh, obtain more expertise. In this scenario, we could think about, you know, a conservative care clinic th the way that Hamilton has now developed one, and we can then pot potentially help quarterback things or, again, act as a safety net. Looking beyond that, um, if we are able to come up with a model that can be replicated in other Fraser sites, I think it would then make sense to look at whether or not we could expand into other centers in BC as well. From a transplant standpoint, um, my hope is to continue to support these geriatric assessments um, out of the transplant center, so at St. Paul's Elder Care Clinic. Um, so for example, if a patient was um, coming from, let's say, Kelowna for their pre-transplant assessment, and they were felt to need a geriatric assessment as well, then what we've done is to try and coordinate so that the patient would then see me on the same trip. From an educational uh, perspective, you know, I think we have exciting opportunity for um, electives, for trainees from nephrology or geriatric medicine. Uh, I do think it would be valuable exposure uh, for any uh, palliative nephrology fellow to come. And then finally, you know, as we build up our clinic base and um, local expertise, I do think um, we could look at formalizing a fellowship the way that McMaster has done as well. So in summary, uh, geriatric syndromes are deeply intertwined with kidney disease, kidney care, but require dedicated time and assessment. Comprehensive geriatric assessments uh, provide patients, families, and providers with a head-to-toe assessment to help optimize function, optimize quality of life, and assist with advanced care planning. Integrating these assessments into the renal setting can then help inform prognosis, patient, family understanding of health and disease, and guide ESRD decisions. And my vision is to build a multidisciplinary approach using pre-existing renal infrastructure that then may help expand geriatric care beyond what we can currently do. So none of this would have been possible without support from um, everyone here on this uh, slide um, who have really gone above and beyond to support my endeavors. So um, the divisions of geriatric medicine at Providence and UBC, Dr. Janet Koo, uh, Dr. Martha Spencer, and Dr. Wendy Cook, uh, as well as my clinical supervisors, Dr. Jocelyn Chase, Amanda Hill, and Naz Parmar. I need to thank uh, Dr. Levin and Dr. Bolia at St. Paul's as well for being open um, to such an idea and having renal you know, patients seen in dedicated geriatric assessment at the elder care clinic. Um, in Fraser Health, um, big thank you to our current working group and Dr. Mel Brown, as well as uh, Marco, our pharmacist, Shimpei and Rosanna, our social workers, who have been instrumental in launching our new clinic, as well as um, uh, Dr. Belinda Robinson, who is our uh, regional department head in geriatric medicine and, and who has kindly agreed to um, um, entertain uh, the prospects of joining uh, our clinic at Royal Columbian. And then finally, Dr. Joseph at McMaster, who has really um, unselfishly shared all, all of her progress and ideas uh, from afar to uh, collaborate uh, on our <laughs> shared vision for geriatric nephrology. Uh, thank you everyone for your attention and happy to take any questions or comments. Thanks, Wayne. That was uh, great and certainly lots of food for thought. There, um, There is a question from Dr. Elliot about um, whether or not on a, for a scalability a thing, whether or not um, you might be able to teach or share with general nephrologists um some standardized evaluation that might actually help to you know to both upskill us i think but also um ideally to appropriately triage etc so I, I wonder if you have some thoughts about i mean i think it, it's a great idea to integrate i think it's great to use the existing resources and then build on that um and scale but i still think that the expertise is uh not not to be uh ignored and i think that but some kind of triage system, because as you know, like the median age in the dialysis unit is 72. So you could technically just see everybody, right? But that's not, I think, what you're telling us. Um, so thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
yeah, absolutely. I, I certainly would uh, be interested in, in doing something like that. And, uh, you know, the, the idea is not to turn um, every nephrologist into a, into a geriatrician, but I do agree there are, um, you know, screening tools or, or triage uh, tools out there that can be used, for example, when you're looking at cognition. So, you know, you can have somebody administer the full uh, cognitive test, but there are also sort of shortcuts to try and um, um, flag patients. Uh, so, um, you know, tools like doing a mini cog, for example, which is a three word recall and a clock draw test, um, you know, or doing a clock draw test on its own. You know, those would be very short and easily um, doable tests uh, that if an abnormal finding uh, is, is revealed, can then prompt a deeper dive into a cognitive assessment, for example. So yes, for sure. Great. Other questions that people have? You can unmute yourself. There's just a few minutes left, but really um, a lot of food for thought. And I think, um, I guess the notion of Zoom, <laughs> of uh, virtual visits is something that may or may not work in this moment. But as I reflect, there are a group of people who are 50 and 60 who will age and they will be competent at using zoom and other things but that may not be the the whole thing i just wonder um then gaylene has a question um do you feel comfortable with capacity assessment the issue often arises when patients don't appear to understand the severity of their comorbidities oh yeah yeah capacity capacity is, is tricky and you know i i must admit it is still uh, an uncomfortable um topic and um, one that does come up more often than we expect. Um, you know, from my experience in geriatric medicine, you know, capacity is something that people um, call upon, but is really our, our last resort um, when it comes to the care of patients, because, you know, to, to um, you know, in many ways, set aside patient autonomy in favor of, let's say, safety. Um, does take a high bar to clear. And you do have to think about, you know, what are the ramifications for deeming a person incapable of, of consenting to X procedure or X treatment? You know, if they do not um, consent to, let's say, uh, perm -calf reinsertion, well, if you were to find them incapable, how would you then facilitate the treatment necessary uh, would you sedate them? Would you restrain them? Would you then yeah. do it every run thereafter in order to make sure they don't pull out their perm cath? So yeah, it's a it's a tricky topic. And um, you know, often we would have to look at whether or not the risk is truly intolerable to the patient, or if the risks are actually present to other people, in which case maybe the bar would be a little bit different. So geriatricians um classically have helped with capacity assessments. And this is probably an area that uh, I would rely on my, my colleagues with more um, uh, experience. Yeah, no, oh, there's a third quick question just because it's such a great topic. Um, oh, an interesting question, whether or not anyone's compared or whether you have a sense of whether cognitive and frailty decline is more with hemo versus PD. <laughs> Um, interesting question. Yeah, um, I guess anecdotally, <laughs> you know, we do see a difference. But as you all know, they're really uh, quite different patient populations. Um, the literature seems to suggest that um, hemodialysis uh, incurs more uh, vascular insults or more changes suggestive of vascular insults, given the nature of the therapy. But overall, um, there hasn't really been a strong difference when people have looked at hemo versus PD, uh, whether or not it truly uh, results in more cognitive decline in one therapy or another. But of course, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, we do see PD patients doing better, but, you know, they were better patients to, to begin with. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's confounded a little bit. There's what, I think it's time for one quick question from Susan. Cooper? Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you, Dara Way. No, first of all, thank you for an excellent presentation. But I just wanted to comment where I think this is a 
huge need is for the pre-transplant assessment because I have a lot of um, frail people who may be in their late 60s and it's always that struggle to know when I, when I personally don't think that they're a good transplant candidate, then they'll say that I'm discriminating them against them based on age. So it's always that struggle, but you could have an excellent 75 year old. So I just wanted to comment, thank you for um, creating this clinic. And I think it's a huge need, especially in my opinion, from the pre-transplant assessment. Yeah, no, thanks, Susan. That's great. Yeah, so Wayne, thank you for an outstanding presentation, also for all that you're doing and look forward to spreading and scaling. Uh, with your expertise and leadership um, so that we have a really great integrated geriatric nephrology program over time. So thank you for uh, preparing this and for stimulating the thought and discussion and happy sunny Friday, everybody, <laughs> if you're in BC. <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye.